Hello, welcome back to Movie Husbands. Today we're reviewing The Holdovers. Directed by Alexander Payne, The Holdovers follows a history teacher at a New England boarding school who is forced to chaperone the handful of students with nowhere to go over Christmas break. The film stars Paul Giamatti, Divine Joy Randolph, and Dominic Sessa. So Jeffrey, why don't you do us a solid and give us a little Alexander Payne backstory. <laughs> well, it, in our Priscilla review, I talked about how Lost in Translation was a, a very formative film for me. And that was around the time that I started getting really into independent films where I deviated from more popular films, more big budget films, and started noticing how much I was loving independent films. So this was around the time of Lost in Translation, of Punch Drunk Love, and a year after those two films came Sideways, which was, again, a quite a pivotal film for me as I saw it in the theaters. I saw it in our local independent theater, which unfortunately closed recently, very sad, but I did see Sideways at the Criterion. I loved that movie, and I loved so much about how heartfelt and melancholy and tender of a film it was about people dealing with depression and dealing with the life not lived, and, and all of these things that I, I grew to really enjoy about films and about literature as I grew older were in, in some ways in their infancy in these uh, or these early films. Sideways is maybe his most acclaimed, but he's, re he's known for a film called Election with Reese Witherspoon and Matthew Broderick that is incredibly biting and so good and so funny. And from there, he went on to more grown up kind of mature work. So Sideways about Schmidt. He made Nebraska. Which I love Nebraska. Yeah. Oh, The Descendants is another good film of his. So in, in maybe 20 years, he's made like eight or nine films. So I wouldn't say he's prolific, but he he certainly makes a film, you know, every five to seven years. And about the time that a new film of his comes out, I'm about ready to go back to that place because his films are warm in a certain way. Like I have always been attracted to this kind of warmth, melancholy mix that his films bring. And it's very rare to find in films nowadays. It's a tone that was a lot more popular in the, the heyday of like the 2000s of independent cinema, you know, like Garden State and things like that. Anyhow, I think that The Holdovers is very much in his lexicon. And I mean that in a positive way. It's a film that completely fits in his filmography and is maybe even a touch warmer than those other films. So it was written by David Hemmingson, who I'm not really familiar with, but Alexander Payne's screenplays tend to focus more on the melancholy than the the warmth, then I would argue that this film is a little more into the warmth than the melancholy, although it does have both. If he had written this film and the screenplay was entirely in his hands, I think that it would have been quite a bit more dour. Just going off of the films he's written, like about Schmidt and Sideways, those are films that focus a lot more on the melancholy than they do on the warmth, in my opinion. This film is a lot more about the warmth, and I think that maybe a mass audience or our parents will respond to that in this film and something I enjoyed about it too. Yeah, it's one of those films that's a conversational piece as much as it is a character piece. He really tends to focus on characters and their stories and how they drive the narrative rather than the other way around, which is something I really love about his films. That plays a lot in this movie because we follow Paul Giamatti's character who plays a history teacher and he is the embodiment of a cynical intellectual. Alexander Payne almost always has this character who's like a very witty sad sack. Paul Giamatti played that same character in Sideways, and I grow so attached to these types of characters. Maybe I relate to them because I'm an old soul. You are soul. pretty much just like them. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I am an old soul, and I am quite cynical, but I also can be quite witty in my time. So uh, I always relate to these, these characters. As we were talking about, he is very cynical, but he loves using his intellect in a way that lends itself so well to the comedy in this movie. And that is saying something so smart and so history buffy that nobody else in the room could relate to it. So that when he says it, everybody just blankly stares at him. Yeah, he'll say something like, you vulgarian Visigoths. And those things, they even go over my head. I'm like, I don't know what that means, <laughs> but I understand the humor in it of him knowing these things. And he's trying to interestingly enough, relate to other people, but nobody is on his wavelength. Mm -hmm. So I think that's where the cynical side of him comes out. There's no one that matches him. I think that makes him sad in a way, yeah. but he also doesn't really know how to adapt himself to other people and get on their level. And I think a lot of this movie is about that, trying to figure out how to connect with other people that are different from yourself. I think Paul Giamatti was perfectly cast in this role. He displayed such a great sense of character from the way he spoke to his mannerisms. He can range so quickly from great 
great looks of annoyance to being somewhat oddly endearing. Mm -hmm. And I really love that about his character. The acting side of it kind of disappears. You can't even tell that he had to study the script. It's like he remembered it so deeply that the words are just coming to him as if they were in a regular conversation. I can't think of a way of saying this that sounds like more positive, but he's basically on autopilot in this movie because he's played these types of characters so many times and he's so good at it that he doesn't even need to think in order to just give us a great performance, right? He basically has to show up, be Paul Giamatti in the typecast way, and you're probably going to get like an Oscar worthy performance out of him. Another thing I like about Giamatti's character is I don't think it's it's a spoiler to say that he goes through a bit of a transformation through the film. So these films always start with the cynical misanthrope who doesn't care about anybody. And then his heart grows a little bit larger and he's able to care about people in a certain way. He's pretty much like the Grinch. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, we've seen that transformation in films innumerable times. And I've seen it really poorly paced where suddenly characters are just completely different people mm. tomorrow than they were the previous day. They're suddenly these beautiful, heartwarming people. I actually think that the film did this pretty well because Paul Giamatti's character has changed only in little ways towards the end of the film. He definitely does care about the people around him more, and he cares about himself a little bit more in the way that he learns to love himself and take steps forward. But at the same time, he's still a cynical jerk as the movie ends yeah. in a lot of ways. I felt like that was very expertly paced, and I don't think the film did this unrealistic transformation of his character, which I really liked. Yeah, he changed in several ways, but it didn't compromise his personality. Yeah, exactly. He just learned some new things, some new tricks in ways that he could talk to other people and relate to other people. Yeah, it's a very realistically dynamic character portrait, um, which obviously Alexander Payne has been quite good at for some time. We should talk a bit about Divine Joy Randolph's performance. It really would not shock me if she was nominated for Best Supporting Actress and even maybe might have a shot at winning. Not only is it an Oscar-worthy performance, but it's a performance that the Oscars typically like to recognize. She has a very morally generous attitude that she's able to counteract some of the things that Paul Giamatti is saying throughout the film. And she's a very sympathetic character who goes through her own struggles throughout the film. With all of those kind of different dynamic types of acting, it's definitely a showcase and something I could easily see winning an Oscar, and I think it would be deserving. She is such a scene stealer in this movie. She has some wonderful moments. There's some moments at the school where she is sitting watching TV with Paul Giamatti's character. And these moments are just so endearing that Paul Giamatti's character has his guard is just let down immediately. He has nowhere really to go with his cynicism mm -hmm. because she immediately disables it by her being so nice. I do agree that she's quite a bit more like heartfelt than the other two characters, but she has a hard edge, which is I think oh, is yeah. how they, they relate to each other. But she doesn't seem as stuck on it. as It's almost like she's accepted it and she's able to make a joke about it and be like, that's just the way it is. Whereas Paul Giamatti's character is more just completely overwhelmed with states of events. Yeah, the characters I would say are very simple in this film but they also have a layers of complexity underneath them, which is nice to see. And we could talk about that in terms of one scene that I remember with her character where they're going to a holiday party. She starts playing a track that's on the vinyl and it's a Christmas song that her, and her son used to dance to. And this is a very emotional moment for her because her son is no longer around. With the beauty of this scene, and I think this could be one of the Oscar scenes that if they submit, they would submit this one because there is this moment where she refuses to change the song even though these younger kids want her to change it. And she slightly just falls back into the furniture behind her and the camera slowly moves in on her face and there's just so much going on mm -hmm. in the look. You could tell that she's just reminiscing because she's not there. She's not present. Mm -hmm. And you could see that in her eyes that she's she's off somewhere else. It was such a fantastic scene. And going from there, I do want to get to Dominic Sess's character. He plays one of the students, the main student in the school that is left behind for this Christmas break. He is also dealing with his place in his family, in the world, mm -hmm. trying to relate to people. So he similarly has a lot of the same problems as Paul, but they don't really know it yet. And that's yeah, one of yeah. the things that they come to find out throughout the course of the movie. Dominic's performance is, um, is I think, overall pretty good. I did find his performance a little stilted and maybe a bit too rehearsed that there, there's like an amateur quality to some of it. But there are times where he's spellbindingly good. There's a single unbroken close-up shot where he's talking about his father, I think, in, in a restaurant or diner setting that is completely heartbreaking, but very subtly acted. And frankly, is a performance far beyond his years. But there are other scenes of his that felt a little stilted to me. I think of, of everyone's performances, I'm a little mixed on his, but again, there are some diamonds in the rough there. On that note, I would say one of the negatives I did see in this movie was that some of the plot devices seemed a little bit glaring to me. Mm. I think most of that had to do with the other kids that were originally staying behind, and then all of a sudden they find a way for them to be gone. Yeah. So the whole like purpose and the manufacturing of them being there and then leaving, I don't know why the other kids had to be there in the first place. I didn't find their 
prominence to be something that was very necessary to the film. I think what we had at the beginning, especially with one of those other kids in the classroom, that's kind of a jerk, yeah. um, him at the beginning and him at the end. I don't think anything that was in the middle of that really added much. I think sometimes it's to the film's detriment. Sometimes it's to its benefit, but it's very purposely aimless. Like it goes from chapter to chapter and scene to scene without much momentum. It's just happy to sit in the moment. Again, sometimes that's something that's really great. Other times I did feel the film dragging a little bit. It's not conventionally tightly written at all. So like we recently saw The Killer. That is a film that I would argue that all the details are very tight in it. This film is more just kind of trying to go from place to place, scene to scene, character to character without that kind of perfect structure feeling. Here, it did feel a little... <laughs> hmm. I don't know how to say this. It felt cohesive? like felt this what cohesive. Yeah, it felt less cohesive. Less than it could cohesive. Have. Yeah, okay. than it could have been. <laughs> One of the things I did really like in this film was the production design. I think it was very yeah. subtle. Once they leave the school, there is a lot of things they have to pay attention to because they end up going to Boston, mm -hmm. and there are so many vintage cars in the roads. I think about like the scouting for these locations and things like that. And I just had an immense respect for all the little things I noticed in the background, the certain signage that are on the windows of the stores that they pass by, how the restaurants that they go to are decorated, the extras in the background and the mm -hmm. clothes that they were wearing. Uh, funny enough, there was one moment that broke this continuity where they were traveling to Boston. And on their way, I saw in the background, there was a little street going downward and I saw some modern day cars that oh, they really? did not catch. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. It was a very funny moment, but it also reminded me just the amount of work that goes into film and making sure all these little details show up on the screen. I like how the film is purposely old fashioned too. So the way it starts is it shows you the rating. It shows you that it's rated R and you hear like static and pops in the sound, almost like you would hear it in old school movie theater. The focus features symbol is kind of redone as a 70s icon which is kind of interesting the film is very much trying to emulate a lot of these like campus films of the 1970s or maybe even campus novels like stoner or one of philip roth's novels it's something that i think wears its influence totally on its sleeve especially compared to most of the films we've seen this year we haven't really seen a film like this this year but also we've seen this type of film before so this is a type of film done fairly well in a way that we've seen before. So you're ready to go to grades? Yeah, I'm gonna give The Holdovers a B plus. I think it's mostly lovely. It's a heartfelt and tender film. I think where it falters somewhat is it engages with some heavy themes that I found a little bit cursory. I think if you're going to engage with themes such as depression, such as grief, that you should perhaps give them a bit more screen time and a bit more of a conclusion or, or something that I can learn from the film. I found more that it would just skirt the surface of these very heavy themes and not delve into them very deeply. So I would have preferred it do that and maybe maintained its sense of humor. I think that's something that it could have done, but instead it chose to have like a more vague interpretation of those. There's a lot of films this year that I like better than this film that I consider to be masterworks or greater pieces of art, but I'm probably more likely gonna watch this film again than one of those films just because it was so nice and so easy to watch. I think this film was released at the perfect time because probably around the time this review comes out is the week of Thanksgiving and people are going to be visiting their families. A lot of people go to the movies on a long weekend. This is the perfect movie to see with your parents. This is a movie that you will enjoy, that your parents will enjoy, that the whole family for the most part will enjoy. I mean, anyone who's over 13 years old, I think, <laughs> would find something interesting to see about this movie. Ultimately, it's a film that explores loneliness during the holidays and the ways in which people devote themselves to each other. And I think that's um, a very heartwarming thing to see during the holidays. I completely agree. I do give the film a bit of pass on what you were talking about earlier in regards to its heavy themes, because I did see it as this takes place over a Christmas break, which is literally two weeks. So I don't think there is so far that you could go in a natural way without it becoming too unnatural. So that's why I like that it skirted these issues, but didn't go too deep into them. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, we've seen films that take place over one day that have engaged with these issues in a very interesting way. I don't necessarily think like the, the temporal restrictions of it are, you know, necessarily an excuse, but that's just my opinion. With that said, I do give this movie a B plus as well. I did find that with those heavy themes, this movie does play a lot with sadness. And I think by the end of the movie, there's some things that aren't resolved or some things that happen, which I'm not going to spoil, but aren't necessarily the best case scenario. Mm -hmm. it really goes to show you that the struggle still continues in some way or life just goes on. I thought you were about to say the struggle is real. <laughs> the struggle is real. The struggle is real. <laughs> but I think for all the sadness that's built in this film, it just has such a great capacity for love and human connection. I completely agree with what you said earlier. I think this film felt very cozy and like a big hug. Mm -hmm. And 
It's not because the film is joyful in a certain sense, but I think there's just so much you can relate to. Whether it's losing a loved one or feeling out of place in the world, I think these things are very universal to the human experience. Being able to relate to that in such a genuine, caring way is just very comforting. Yeah, and actually a scene that you mentioned before we even started filming was that wonderful scene in the museum where Paul Giamatti talks about how all the ways in which we feel and all of the things we do, they were there in ancient times and they continue on in modern times. Just to put a side note, since this takes place during Christmas, this is one of my favorite Christmas movies I think I've seen in a while. <laughs> oh yeah, we really haven't had a lot of great Christmas movies in the past you know, 10 or 20 years in my opinion. All right, and that's it for our review of The Holdovers. The Holdovers is now in theaters, so if you haven't seen it, go check it out. If you've seen The Holdovers, let us know in the comments, what did you think about this film? As always, thank you guys for watching and we'll see you next time.